take the electric sun. The electric sun is actually a product of something called the electric universe, which is a cosmological explanation for how the universe is. It believes that the universe can be better explained in terms of uh, electricity and magnetism than it can be in terms of gravity. The electric sun is taken to be a charged body that receives its energy as a stream of electrons through the empty vacuum of space from the centre of the galaxy, a bit like plugging in a lamp and turning it on. Now I'm not saying that the electric universe is right or wrong. What troubles me about the electric universe isn't the idea itself, but the response to it. It seems to be universally two responses. One is the product, it's the product of quackery, and the other is that the people involved in it are really just horrible people who are after nothing more than your money. And I think the troubling idea here is that holier-than-thou attitude, that science is being practised as a pure thing. But of course, science isn't practised as an idea. Science is something that is practised by people. And if we look at the practice of science, both historically and now, what we discover is that what's been done with the electric universe is in fact not that different to what was done in the development of science. If you think about physics, I would say you can't, would come up with three people. Newton, Einstein and Feynman. And their ideas were landmarks in our understanding of the universe. And I would most certainly not disagree with that. Let's take Newton as an example. Newton, I would say, was famous for three things. Gravity, calculus, and the laws of motion. Where did those ideas come from? The general image is that Newton was sitting in dark groom, or he was sitting under an apple tree, and the notion occurred to him. An apple fell on his head, and that's how we think of it in our sanitised version of how Newton came up with the idea of gravity. But that's not quite how it happened. The idea of gravity, and the idea that it obeyed the inverse square rule, was actually talked about by Robert Hooke in 1665, which is some 21 years before Newton came out with it in Principia. Now, Hooke and Newton began a correspondence in 1679, and they, Hooke put forward his ideas and argued them with Newton. Then Newton published them in Principia, and that really upset Hooke, and Hooke actually demanded that he get some kind of recognition from Newton. And Newton absolutely refused, and it began a bitter dispute between the two men. So much so, and so vindictive was Newton about this, that when he became head of the Royal Society, he ordered all of New uh, Hooke's portraits to be destroyed, and any reference to the man to be wiped out, so that he would be the last man standing when it came to the idea of gravity. And that was something of a theme with Newton. Is of course Newton started talking about calculus in about 1693, something like that. But Leibniz had already been talking about calculus in 1684, and that's nine years before Newton actually started talking about it. In 1704, of course, it was um, Newton who published On Calculus, and it began the Leibniz-Newton controversy of who invented calculus. Now it happens that Leibniz notations were so much more usable than Newton's notations that we use the Leibniz method now, not the Newton method. But we use it without crediting Leibniz, we credit Newton, who again, according to the controversy, stole it from Leibniz. Now what they actually say is that they developed it independently. But it was Newton who got most of the publicity for it, and so it's Newton who actually gets the acclaim for it. If we think about the laws of motion, and there are three of them. The first law of motion is that there is a body is at rest, or if a body is in motion, it will stay at rest or stay at motion until another force acts on it. The second law is where we get the famous F equals MA, where the force on a body is equal to the mass of the body times its acceleration, when force and acceleration have both direction and magnitude. So that's one of the really famous ones that we use to develop models today. And um, even in Principia, Newton admitted, famous quote, that he stood on the shoulders of giants. 
And he admitted that those ideas are actually pulled from um, Galileo and Kepler. His third law states for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. He himself credited uh, Huygens and Venerous as being the people who actually came up. Newton did have some really good attributes. I mean, the man himself was something of a crank, actually. He um, almost equally investigated alchemy, theology, numerology, astrology, and science, optics, and mechanics. And he treated them all as being equal. Now, we just recognise the mechanics aspect of it, but the whole broader aspect of it is something that Newton considered on an equal basis. He, for instance, claimed that he in fact had found the Philosopher's Stone, that great stone that will give unending life and change lead into gold. Those ideas, of course, have been conveniently forgotten because the idea that you could turn lead into gold would try, um, destroy the economy of Europe, and so it was, in fact, a capital offence to invent the Philosopher's Stone, and any writings that would claim that could lead you to being hung, drawn, and quartered. That literally was the punishment for doing that because it was conceived of as real. And so when Newton did those things. He kept them in his notebooks, but he never published them. He published all the stuff on mechanics and optics, but never published the other stuff because of fear of retribution. His arguments with Leibniz and Hook show that he was actually quite a vindictive man. And when he rose into a position of prominence, he used that position, uh, position to self-promote to make sure that his enemies were put down and never mentioned and he was promoted. So he got the recognition because he made sure he got the recognition. Newton himself, apart from being involved in a whole range of studies, most of which we would consider quackery, was uh, something of an odd fellow who would do experiments by stabbing himself in the eyes with needles. We're not talking about little needles, they were bodkins about this size that we'd put into his eyes to work out the ideas of optics. He was at best a misogynist. He never had a relationship. He, it was uh, supposed that he died a virgin. And he actually had a bitter argument with the philosopher John Locke, who was a friend of his at the time, for attempting to embroil him with women, as the quote goes. <laughs> so modern interpretations of the man actually assumed that he was um, autistic. Probably Asperger's, something like that. But despite his shortcomings, we still attribute him with these great three things, and that's a common theme that we have. I mean, Tesla won a court decision that he was the inventor of radio. But if you look in any textbook, it'll still say Marconi. Same thing, really, even though it's becoming recognised that basically Newton stole all of his ideas from everybody else and was a selfless, uh, a shameless self-promoter, if you look in any textbook, it will still talk about Newton's three laws. But what does it matter who came up with them? We still know that those... Now we know Newton was wrong, because if Newton wasn't wrong, we wouldn't have Einstein, the next great figure. Incidentally, Newton believed that the planetary system was destined to go into disequilibrium unless God came along and pushed it neatly back into equilibrium every, every now and then. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that science is wrong, nor do I think that the scientific method is invalid. What I think is that we as people have an unfortunate tendency or two. I think that the response to the electric universe, the electric sun, is um, rooted in those human foibles, because it seems to me that the almost universal response is to degrade it and denounce it as quackery, even though the birth of science itself is rooted in the very same quackery. And the greats of science, actually, have an awful lot that doesn't recommend them as opposed to does recommend them. So I think writing off a new idea that you just don't like in those knee-jerk human responses is the response that is wrong. I think that there is a better way that we can deal with this. I think there's a better way of approaching this. And that is, why is it that people actually don't like science? Where is this rejection coming from? What is it? that scientists are doing wrong so that the bulk of the population thinks this has got nothing to do with me. If you look at all the videos I do, the whole point of it is to point out how simple things can be at their basics, how we can actually derive that information just from investigating our own real world. And to me, that is the responsibility of science, not to write things off, 
not to throw things away, but to ask, how is it that we're not involving people in something that is a fascinating exploration of the world? So, I don't necessarily agree with the electric universe or the electric sun, but I don't think that really matters. I think what's important is that we open the doors to people rather than close them. And we close them with mysticism, with mathematics, with jargon. And I think that is where the real error is when it comes to the electric sun. And the whole thing about talking about Newton was just to point out that maybe we live in a bit of a glass house. Maybe we are not the people without sin. So we should think before we start throwing those stones. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you don't agree with the electric sun stuff, I hope you enjoyed the background on Newton. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.